Good morning again. I'd like to call you all's attention to our panel of the uh, video presentation. You click the wrong one. Our no. Sure, good right up there. Yeah. It's supposed to be playing though. back table. Yeah, I mean, 
But it's full of clean out here. Yeah, full clean. And it was. I'm saying it's a slideshow, so it should be going automatically, right? This is a new computer. This is a new computer. So I don't think. Let's keep hitting the next slide. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to. I don't want to sit up here and. Yeah. I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, I have to do it because the slideshow piece is not working. I'm just, no, well, Irma was just saying let it play. Yeah, I do need a mic. the names because it's supposed to be already a, a show you know yeah to, to go but it's yeah. not doing it yeah well she's giving you a microphone go back go back to the beginning okay let's start it over yeah i just want me to talk It is on enable, but I don't know about activate. So they don't. I don't think they have the PowerPoint, uh, the Microsoft Suite. You know, that was just a new thing. So that's the problem. Okay, let's try it again. I gotta hear my voice. It's just supposed to play on its own. But you get the melodious sounds of God. Our alarms are listed in the order in which they be passed. So not necessarily in alphabetical order, but from last year, this uh, time, or August 2018, on up to uh, last month. We have Clara B. Wallace, class of 1959. We have Cecil Marie Williams Lakey, class of 1975. Dorothy Lewis Venters, class of 1979. Norman Edward Dyer, Sr., class of 1958. Mr. Talbot Sharp, Sr., class of 1950. Lovius Choice, Sr., class of 1958. Maude Peyton Womack, class of 1967. <clears throat> Gertha Sanders Dickerson, excuse me, class of 1947. Dolores Walker Cabillo, class of 1967. 
Miles Sammy Carter, Sr., class of 1954. Espanola Pruitt, Thacker, class of 1955. John Weldon Berry, Sr., class of 1962. Marvin Howard, class of 1968. Louise Thornton Becton, class of 1959. Mantle Fadia, class of 1967. 77, 76. Transposing here. <laughs> Mary Frances Armstrong, class of 1962. Wanda Joyce Salone Jew, class of 1967. Clement Bo Daniels, class of 1959. Maude Ferguson, former Miss Peavy, 1964, class of 1964. Lorena Simon Armstrong, Simon Armstrong, excuse me, class of 1972. Charles Edward Tatum, Michael Melton, class of 1967. George Wilson Thomas, class of 1961. Marie Johnson Ratcliffe, former Miss Peavy, 1965, class of 1965. Gloria Massey Turan, class of 1956. Idell Mildred Ellis, Bastine Hightower, Melvin Myers, class of 1959. Myrtle Smith Rogers, class of 1958. Pastor Hyde Austin, class of 1973. Doyle Donald Carrington. Class of 1957. Dudley Raleigh Mosley, class of 1973. <coughs> C. Georgette Stanley, class of 2005. Ernest Faye Epps Franklin, excuse me. Jerry <clears throat> Wayne Kellum, class of 1975. Stephen W. Lipscomb, Sr., class of 1985. We want to thank you for joining us in this memorial tribute to the Panthers Beyond the Hill. 
Please keep the families in your prayers as they adjust to a new journey. And I'd like to ask for a moment of silence. Thank you. As you know, <clears throat> Panthers, Fergie really does produce productive people. So when our technology gets a little um, iffy, you got to be productive, right? In right. any case, in any situation, by any means necessary. So next, I'd like to introduce the introduction of the keynote speaker. <laughs> we'll have Lieutenant uh, Colonel, retired Lieutenant Colonel, Kenneth King. Good morning. Good morning. I would like to start by apologizing on behalf of Lieutenant Colonel Henderson. <laughs> he and I spoke within the last few days. And he is very sorry that he could not be here today. But not to worry, I'm Dr. Kenneth Henderson, Captain of the United States Navy retired. Go Navy! Our memorial service speaker for this morning is Mr. Frank Jackson, a man whose reputation precedes him. Since you have Frank's information in your packages, I will only highlight certain portions of his biography. Frank grew up in Lubin, Texas. In 1969, he entered Purdue A&M College and earned a four-year Naval ROTC scholarship. Frank graduated in 1973 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Geography. After completing his active duty Navy requirement in 1982, he joined the U.S. Naval Reserves and retired as an 06, which translates to the rank of Captain of the U.S. Navy. Starting in 1982, Frank had several positions at our alma mater, such as Director of Student Initiatives and Development, and he currently serves as Assistant Vice Chancellor for Government Relations, Texas A&M University System. Frank served as mayor of Purdue for an astonish astonishing seven year terms. Frank is a member of numerous fraternal organizations, notably Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He was inducted into Purdue's Force Hall of Fame in 2010, and he also has been a prolific writer who is the author of five books. Mr. Frank Jackson is married to the former Marion Elaine Jones. They have four children and two grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Frank Jackson. Good morning. Good morning. First, give an all praises and honor to God. I'm extremely honored and deeply honored to be invited to be a part of this memorial celebration. It's very sobering to see the Panthers that have gone on before us, and it just reinforces how fragile life is. <coughs> and those sayings that make us think that we have to do the work while we can, because when night comes, none of us can work. So I want to thank the officers of this great alumni association for letting me be a part of this family gathering. And I also want to thank my wife, Mary Elaine Jones Jackson, uh, for being with me, and we were not here at the beginning, we were celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary. So, you may have slide that in. <laughs> well, just for a short time, and I'm, I promise to keep it short, uh, I want to talk about Prairie View before desegregation and Prairie View after desegregation. 
You see, I'm one of those tweeners that have lived on both sides of that uh, era. I grew up doing segregation, so I saw that. And then I lived now through integration, what's well, supposed to be integration. So we've seen this transition. When I got to Purdue, it didn't look like it looked today. Mm -hmm. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. It was kind of rough. <laughs> but being from the country, it was better than what I came from. <laughs> so I didn't know any better. <laughs> but I've been able to. Well, I guess I've been blessed. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen them bring in the grass and pour the sidewalks and haul in trees and, and just transition right in front of my eyes. It's like watching that Star Trek movie when they dropped that Genesis bomb on that planet and everything just started to bloom. But it caused me to, to think about the old privilege. Because having been there and worked in, with the students in the student center and the student life, you've seen transitions. So just for a minute, let me talk about those two, two things. But I got to set the groundwork and I got to do this. I think uh, we need to keep in mind what Dr. DeVos said about those three streams of thinking. It came to us from the death ship. And his book, Souls of Black Folk, which I know most of y'all have read, there's a chapter called On the Training of Black Men for Work. He said there were three streams of thinking. He said the first was from the Europeans. He said once they had acquired knowledge, once they had come to use their intellects in a very methodical way, they had come to believe that God had so blessed them that it was their duty to subdue the earth and all men, black, brown, yellow, white, and form this new humanity. He said, but behind that thought was a dark afterthought of force and dominion, the making of black and brown and yellow men to dare, and the temptation of bees and red calico color. That's where we get this idea of white supremacy. He said, the second thought that came down to us from the death ship what well, the thoughts of the old South. And see, here in Texas and Prairie View, we, we got to keep reminding ourselves that we're in the old South. He said that the older Southerners, the aristocracy especially, uh, came to believe that somewhere between man and cattle, God created this tertium quid, this intermediate thing, and called it a Negro, a simple clownish creature, yet lovable within its limitations. But Dr. DeVos said behind that thought was an even darker afterthought that the older Southerners also knew that perhaps by chance some of them may learn to use their intellects. Some of them may learn to, to, to come to and recover their historical memory. So out of pure self-defense, so we dare not let them. So they decided to build around us a wall so wide and placed between us and any knowledge so thick that we would not even think of breaking through. He said, well, what is that veil? That veil is, I'm speaking to you in English. I am not an English man. Most of us came out of West Africa. We were Ibu, Fulani, Ashanti, Hausa, Yoruba, Mandinka. Those were somebody, if we had God, Billy Ungay, Weary, Ogun, all of this has been wiped from our minds. And DeVos said the third and the darkest thought that trickled down to us from the death ship were the thoughts of the things themselves. He said, You ask the average Negro at the turn of the last century, say, What do you want? They will say, Bob say for us, O oh, boastful world, the chances of living men, freedom, opportunity. Equality, but the both said behind that thought was a dark after thought that after all those hundreds of years of bondage, after all those hundreds of years of living behind that veil, even the Negro had come to believe that perhaps the world is right. Perhaps we are not like other men. Perhaps this is some mock mirage from the untrue. See, this is a tangle of thought and afterthought that you've got to really grab if you're going to understand Texas, if you're going to understand Prairie View. You see, Dr. Wolfhawk in his book entitled Prairie View, A Study in Public Consciousness, said that political and economic dominance within the arena of national power 
by any group of groups can lead to a cultural aggression that's designed to alter or reshape the total cultural environment of the vanquished. You see, our whole environment was reshaped for us. See, when you go to Prairie View, you, you, you got to keep in mind that you're in that Brazos River Valley. 25 miles to the southwest is Austin's headquarters. Stephen F. Austin is not only the father of Texas, but he's the father of slavery in Texas. So you got to pin the tail on the dog. <laughs> See, Austin came to Texas at the, at the request of what he called the old 300 people, plantation owners. They had exhausted their lands in the deep south, and they were moving west. And, and Austin's daddy had that land grab from, from the Spanish. And, and by the time Austin got there, Mexico had won its independence. And so Austin came into Texas, and he had to lobby the Mexican government to bring in Negro slaves. Because in his own papers, Austin said, without the Negro, Texas would fail. So he lobbied them, but he ran into opposition down in Mexico. Because in Mexico, there were more African Americans in Mexico during that time than anywhere else in America. So Mexico had a general named Vicente Guerrero. And Vicente was a hero of the Mexican Revolution against Spain. And he was the second president of Mexico. You see, they had that Barack Obama before me. <laughs> and so Austin had to go up against it. Austin hated Guerrero. It's very strange that Austin uh, 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 backed Santa Ana during the presidential election. And eventually, Guerrero came up assassinated. Oh. Austin told his original 300, he said, for each Negro you bring into Texas, he was going to give them an extra 80 acres of land. A rich planter out of Alabama named Jared Ellison Gross. And I highlight Gross because he was the main character. He was one of the richest ones to come into Texas. He brought in 110 enslaved African men, women, and children. He walked into that Brazos River Valley around the current town of Hempstead, going north toward Navasota and south going south toward, toward Brookshire, all total, old man Bush received 44,000 acres of land. His son, Leonard Waller Bush, got 66,000 acres of land. That's the Leno plantation right next door to Prairie View. Uh, uh, Edwin Waller was Bruce's nephew. His, his other great nephew, John Nelson Curry, got several plantations in several farms, he got one as a wedding gift when he married Helen Mar Swearingen, and they called that plantation Alta Vista, which is now Prairie View. So we got to place it and understand what they were doing. See, they made it illegal for us to read or write. If they caught us reading and writing, they whipped us. They beat us, they kept us ignorant legally. So we could cuss better than we could talk. <laughs> and the family just tore us up, just deliberately sold babies out of their mama's arms. This was a reshaping of our whole environment. You see, after the Civil War, and, and, and I think we got to really highlight this. See, we celebrate Juneteenth as the day the Union Journal uh, landed at Galveston Island and read Journal Order Number Three uh, two and a half years late. But see, word didn't get to Waller County until around August the 25th, when General George Armstrong Custer and several thousand cavalry troops rode into Hempstead. And, and I kept asking myself, I said, why in the hell did Custer come to Hempstead? <laughs> but when you start pulling the trail, the Wall folks at the Waller County Historical Commission say he was after Kirby Smith. See, Kirk, the three star Confederate general, Edmund Kirby Smith, was the last three-star general in charge of a major Confederate command. He was in charge of the Trans-Mississippi Command, which was all of the Confederate troops west of the Mississippi River. His headquarters during the final phases of the war was at his cousin's plantation called Alta Vista. With a peg in That meant Purview is probably the last site of the Confederacy. <laughs> He had his family there. His other generals were trying to come there. They were going to start that war all over again. They were waiting on Jefferson Davis to come and join them. And he realized that when Custer was coming, he hot-tailed it out and tried to get to Mexico because he thought they was going to hang it behind. <laughs> we 
got to understand where we are and what this thing was about. See, after that war, the real winners of the war were the laws and business. See, they had financed those enterprises of enslavement. They made millions off of cotton. See, when Austin got there, he had two problems. He had the Indians and he had to clear the land. They got rid of the Indians. They exterminated the Karankawa and they exterminated. See, they demonized. When you demonize the people, those of us who have been in warfare, and know what you demonize the people, you get killed. You call them all kinds of names, Goots and Jerry's and what a Japs and do all that, then you get killed. So you demonize them. Go find the Karanko War. See, Bros gave his Negroes rifles and they rode with Austin and they heard that the Karanko was down the mountain go to bed and they slaughtered them like sheep, shot ducks in the barrel. It was Bros that brought Sam Houston into Texas. It was Bros and Andrew Jackson they plotted that whole Texas Revolution. It all took place in those battles. You see, after that war now, the Northern businessmen had to come to a calculated guess. They hired the president of Brown University, Barnum Sears, as their agent. Brown University keeps popping up, don't you? Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> 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 And Barnum Sears' job was to lobby those southern legislative bodies to help bring about this education system. Because they had reason that if they, that if they could do to the southerners, especially the Negro, like they did to the serfs in Europe, they could raise, raise us up from being slaves to wage earners. One level. Not deep thinkers, just wage earners. That was the, that was the idea. They started to experiment at Hampton University. That's where Booker T was trained. They, they went down to Tuskegee with Booker T. You look at his board of directors, you can find the same Northern captains, George Foster Peabody, William H. Ball, railroad tactics. You just, you just see them pop up out of nowhere. And you had the other, on the other side, you had the Southern aristocrats, the landowners, the plantation owners who were mad because they had lost their investments in that foolish war. They were real mad. But they told the northern businessmen, said, you better watch out. Because we know that there's some sharp people among those, those enslaved people. And if you mess around there and let them get ignited, you let them learn to think, you're going to have hell on your hands. <laughs> they knew that. That's why they put that veil on the But Prairie View has always had a genius there. It's because what those northern capitalists and the southern aristocracy didn't reckon with was us. See, we had our own minds. See, we messed around there, and, and there was this brother born down there in the Brass River Valley, across the river from San Felipe, where Austin's headquarters was, on the Sunnyside Plantation named Norris Ray Cuny. Well, Norris' dad was white, Philip Cuny. His mama was Abilene Stewart. She had several babies for old man Cuny. He had two wives, he married twice. But, but he had several babies by Miss Stewart, a bunch of girls and boys. And she convinced him to send those girls to France and send the boys back east to the Wild Street School for Negroes ran by the Vachon family. They're the same family that took in Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney when they was up there in Pittsburgh. And so the Vachons trained young Cuny. He came back into the South he hooked up with this brother named W.D. Matthews out of Kansas, who was a, a Civil War fighter. And these brothers were on point. And old man Matthews made him the district deputy grandmaster of the King Solomon Grand Lodge out of, out of Leavenworth, Kansas. And eventually, Cuny became the first grandmaster of Prince Hall Masons in Texas. And he set up lodges in San Antonio. He set up in Austin and, and, and uh, over in Galveston and, and Houston. And, and, and what they were doing, they were using those lodges as, as incubators where they could grow up that cadre of leaders. And see, we had uh, two state senators out of that deal. So we got two black state senators now, don't we? Dallas and Houston, Royce and, and Boris. But see, back during Reconstruction, they came out of that valley with prayer people. You had, you had Walter Burton from what is now Waller County and Fort Bend County. You had Matthew Gaines from across the river. We had state representatives doing that era. You had uh, 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 these folks out of Hempstead, 
of William H. Holland. You had George White from right there in Prairie View. He's buried out there behind Prairie View. So you had the players. This is the stronghold. See, them some of us talk to you, let them get to thinking. See, Cuny got slick. Cuny ended up being the head of the Republican Party in Texas. So we were all Republicans then. Oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> when, Cuny, when Cuny figured out the game, he got control of the docks in Galveston. That means he controlled the purse string, the commerce of the cotton and the sugar cane coming out of that valley. Cuny got control of them docks, and he used his, his grand secretary, William Bill Gooseneck MacDonald, to open up a bank in Fort Worth. They call it the Fraternal Bank and Trust. So they was telling black folks to buy land, open up your business, we are finance you, open up a print shop, blacksmith shop, funeral home, beer joint, I don't care what, open up a business. We took off, scared the hell out of white <laughs> So the word came, get killed, slow that brother down. They got it. See, Harlan and those boys, when they when they created Prairie View, they 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 forgot they created A and M. They forgot about Prairie View. But William Harlan, being in the Texas legislature, called the Tech and made them come back because they took their federal money on their land grant and they came back on August 14th and created out out to Vista College for. For colored youth, the AM college for colored youth. William Holland is known as the father of Prairie View. See, William Holland was also the uh, son of a former slave master. His, his daddy uh, was he. Well, let me fix this now. Get it right. <laughs> Holland's mother belonged to Bird Holland's brother. And he was in, Bird Holland was in love with his brother's slave and had babies by her, three boys, William, Milton, and James. He followed that woman into Texas. I don't know what she put on it. <laughs> <laughs> but she convinced him to send those boys to Oberlin College, and, and they, they fought in the Civil War. Milton Holland fought over at Chapin's Farm under General Butler. And Milton was so sharp, a bundle said he wanted to use Milton as an officer because he was black and didn't commission. But he allowed those black troops to, to lead the charge back on glory. And, and Butler said he never seen men fight so ferociously. They ran out of ammunition, they started fighting with their fingernails and their teeth. And Butler said if he couldn't get them the Congressional Medal of Honor, he would create a medal. Thirteen of them got a medal of honor. And I had the honor of going to Austin to the state capitol to a ceremony led by the Buffalo Soldiers out of Houston where they drove a picture of Milton Holland to the state capitol and hung it in the Hall of Honor because Milton Holland became the first Texan to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. You can't keep us down. You can try, but we're going to pop up every now and then. So I'm kind of setting the stage for purview. Because once they created, they had to get a president for purview. By that time, the Southerners were after Cunanan, and they had gotten back in power. As a matter of fact, the governor, Edmund Davis, said there was some trickery going on in the election for governor because he had created a state militia and a state police force, and people like Cunanan were rising to power. So the Southern Democrats, they got after him, they got made an alliance with the little white Republicans, and they were after Cunanan. They were getting Davis out of office. So Richard Cole became the new governor. And Richard Cole is the one that created the AM College for Colored Youth and, and, and eventually Prairie View. And he invited Jefferson Davis to come in and be our first president. How you like that? <laughs> Jefferson Davis said, I can't come. He said, but I'm going to send you a man out of Mississippi. So he sent an ex-Confederate named Thomas Gartwright, who was a past grandmaster of the Masonic Lodge in Mississippi. He told him to bring a colored man to be the principal out there at Prairie View. And he brought L.W. Miner. That's L.W. Miner's seat that's right in front of the administration. Because L.W. Miner came on the recommendation of Jefferson Davis. Let that soak in. <laughs> See, they had us. They controlled us. They made sure we learned what they wanted us to know. And if you got out of, out of bounds, 
you got to find. So if you look at our history, you see every time one of those pistols would raise up prayer to a, a significant degree, they got it. Let's go down the line. It was up your mind. You got out of line. One year. Here come the Madison boys. Uh, E.H. and L.C. E.H. died. L.C. Uh, Mr. Delco tells the story that he went to Austin to get books for the students. And the folks said, hey, what the hell are you doing? He came back, all this stuff was sitting out on the side of the road. <laughs> books. Blackshirt. Blackshirt tried to introduce the college curriculum. Now remember, we just came out of legal ignorance in 1865, so we've been only legally reading and writing since 1865. Do the math. Do the math. The joke was 11 years after legal ignorance, you're going to open up a college? Where are you going to get the students? And what kind of education they going to have? Some of them still making exits. <coughs> it was a joke to them. It was an experience there. But it was always a genius that ever catch a little smart boy and get you come here and put them over to some of y'all were pulled over to the side. I was, y'all were too. Some of them couldn't learn, some of your classmates couldn't get it. But y'all got it, did you? They did it, but over the radar. We'll cut this back short, because it talks about our story. But these folks had to endure. See, Blackshear tried to introduce the college curriculum, and he couldn't do it because the kids wasn't ready for it. And I tell the students now, I say, most of y'all coming in, almost 80 or 90 percent coming in needing some form of remedial education. This stuff has been going on since 1878, when the first kids walked in there. So that means culture change is slow. You don't fix it overnight. You can pass a law tomorrow and the culture is slow. That means these kids, you go back down to some of these schools, and you see what we did when Black should try to right this wrong. He created the, the, the innocent, the Negro of collegiate scholastic league and got us playing sports so he could get the kids acclimated to college life. Eventually they got Black shit. They got Mr. Terrell. They brought in J.G. Osborne. Osborne was friends with the president of a and Brazil. And him and Brazil concocted a, 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 a plan to get uh, nurses. They wanted black nurses to, to get the first degrees because they convinced the board that black nurses may have to help operate on white women and white men. So black should play that. I mean, Osborne played that card. And he got the nursing program. That became our first baccalaureate program. And once he did that, it got lost. <laughs> okay, come on. Here come Willie Luther for Banks. Mm -hmm. Willie got a graduate school started. He started raising the curriculum. Him and the boys used to sit there and pray with you and come up with ideas on creating these educational conferences. They'd have all the black doctors, all the black lawyers, all the teachers, principals would come to Prairie View. All of them had started that old Negro in the Scholastic League and got the ROTC going, and, and, and you had you know, Evans and those guys coming on board. He, saw, he built up a great strong faculty, but banks took it to another level. They were studying us, and they were infusing it into the curriculum. So when you went back to them one room schoolhouses in Raccoon Bend and Lumen and Gonzalez and our <laughs> team, you knew who you were dealing with. They were shaping. We got into the very fabric of those communities. We kept notes in Sunday schools. We were people that they would bring papers to your house and say, Mama wants you to look at this, Mr. Johnson, and say if she needs to sign. Y'all know what we did. We read that paper. So no, maybe don't sign this. Or this is all right, man. You can put your ex down and I sign my name by your ex. We were those people, those prairie regrets. So you can go anywhere in Texas. I like to go to, to these church homecomings out of Canoe Creek, where the old church is sitting on those some ski blocks, tilted on one side. <laughs> <laughs> Got those old funeral home fans broke up in the middle. Dirt out and that's something that went right And once that pastor realized I'm from Prairie View, he's going to beg for me to come up, say something. And invariably, after I get through talking, it's going to be a lady. It's never been a man. It's going to be a little lady. 
She's going to press something in my hand. You know, it's a balled up $5 bill. <laughs> so, you know, I don't pay those $5 bills. They balled up real tight. <laughs> and she said, baby, take this down there and help them children in prayer. They remember prayer and view. They remember those home economics teachers, those ag teachers that came in there and taught them how to do business and did the auctions. They remember. They remember because, see, when you wanted to come to Prairie View, you had to go through a little garden. You had to have a letter from the principal or teacher or somebody saying you were all right. Now, if it was Jeannie Boy or Pookie, that's no, no, no. <laughs> Church. Mama on the front row, the pastor put hands on them. Take up a love offering. <laughs> so that means that the church had a grip on that child, the community had a grip on that child, the school had a grip on that child, and we were no different from these kids. We snuck around trying to get with the little girl, you know, the little girl came to drunk the whiskey, but we respected authority. <laughs> You see Dean coming, start pulling in that run. <laughs> you, know, you respect the prayer you can manage those kids with the dean of men and the dean of women. All Dean had to do was walk through the campus. Folks scatter like roaches. <laughs> See, we got rid of the ROTC mandatory. 
So kids like Frank Jackson coming out of the country of New Texas didn't know nothing about naval science or naval ROTC, just walk right into it. You changed my whole life. I said, Lord, they all used to make us come to this house and we teach us how to eat. I said, we know how to eat. <laughs> Commissioner, JP, constable. That was JP sitting right there. Kid, 
here today. And guess what I said was bigger than that? They can do it too. Because all you have to be is 18 and register to vote. And you tell a kid, they say, you can be county commissioner. You can make, what they make now, 75, 76,000 a year. You go to one or two meetings every nine years. <laughs> to connect with one another. 
They recover your memory and realize nobody's going to save you but you. Right. Don't wait for that white horse riding on the white horse to save you. Nobody's going to save us but us. Come on now. And we can do it. I was pleased when the president of, of Columbia sent for us, paid our way, same group. And when I was in Cartagena, the mayor from Washington, I had invited him to come up to Prairie View. We did a sister city in Britain, Mayor Francisco Paz. And he found out I was in Cartagena. Him and his wife and son flew up. He said, Mayor Jackson, I'm going to change your ticket. I'm going to bring you down to my city in Washington, Columbia. And so I said, well, look, I didn't pay for this ticket. He said, I, he said, I got it. He said, I'm going to get you home on time. He flew me back to Cali. And he picked me up and drove me through 30 miles of nothing but sugar cane. I ain't seen so much sugar cane in my life. And when we got to the outskirts of the city, there were police lined up with 50 cal machine guns, assault rifles. He said, we're going to get out and walk. I said, oh, Lord, I'm not to walk by my <laughs> I know these folks were fighting back and I would have ran up here and come up here. I said, what's going on, my friend? He said, we're getting ready to have a parade. I said, for what? He said, for you. Oh. I said, uh, my Francisco, I didn't bring you nothing. <laughs> I said, you been to prayer with you? You know, we jumped there trying to get it together like you are. He said, man, Jackson, you don't understand. He said, my people, we've been watching African Americans for many, many years. We watched y'all with Brown versus Board of Education. Mayor Francisco was an attorney. He said, we watched Dr. Martin Luther King. We watched the dogs bite each other. And y'all just fighting for basic rights. He said, y'all didn't quit. He said, y'all messed around. And even after they blew King brains out, he said, y'all kept coming. And y'all messed around there and elected Barack Obama, the president <laughs> of the United States. He said, my people would never believe that an African-American mayor from the United States would come off in the middle of this sugarcane field to see them. He said, they've been here. 25,000 of them been here since the Spanish brought them here slaves. He said, by you being here, you represent hope. I'm using you. What can I do? I go walk. The people pour out. They want to connect with all of us in the diaspora. They got reparations down there. Uh, they took me out to the, to the plantation that they got. They got about 3,000 acres. We've been sending our kids down there from uh, architecture and construction science. And they've been working with their students to build affordable houses for zero energy. But they said, we want your ag boys to come down here and help us to develop a, a, a value-added process because we're growing pineapples, guava, a whole bunch of stuff. Sweetest time out little. They said, but we want to add value to it so we could ship it to Prairie View. You, you see what you want to ship it up, then we can distribute it and they can get a return on their investment. And I went to Belize, same thing. Mayor uh, told me, he's, he said, we got mangoes riding on the ground, lonely berries. We need to add value to this stuff. In Senegal, the same thing. They want us to work with them and add value to those products. And I started thinking, I said, wait a minute, they're thinking about this A.I. Thomas thing. Why Doc really driving that? Oh, Doc used to call you. Y'all know, know A.I. Yeah, call you sometimes. Just start talking. I said, well, look what he did. He knew we had retired army officers. He knew he needed those ship drivers. So he got all of us in the Navy, you know. <laughs> Navigation, ship hammer. That's what brought me back to Prairie View to teach navigation and ship hammer. Warships, merchant ships, brewing all those boys, animals, fish. What if? What if, Prairie View? We sit down with these conventions and come up with a plan to reconnect with all of our people in the diaspora and use our talents, our time, and our treasure to build this triangle trade system this time in reverse for us and create wealth for our people, give them clean water, help them to get schools in Belize, help them do stuff and rise up. That's, that's the mission. That's the mission. Prairie View and all those HBCUs across the South, what if they hooked up and used their best researchers and talents to do this thing? That's our way forward. And we can do it because once we reconnect, we're going to recover our memory. And we're going to help ourselves.
fail. So we lost those kids in these new generations because we lost their community. Most of y'all in this room, if you was in your school, wasn't it? Yeah. They taught you. They were your ag teacher, your home economics teacher. I was up in Palestine a couple of weeks ago, went to South down there to Green Bay. A tough one. <laughs> went to Rutledge family. They got all them old NFA aprons that the brothers used to open up with the meetings, had the different symbols on. Some of you had me know what I'm talking about. Well, I'm going to have to take care of you. You have to learn parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules of Order. You have to go a project and learn business rights. They had all new homemaker stuff. Up on, they had all this stuff. So we're creating the Texas Institute for the Preservation of History and Culture and Prayer. We're going to use Jones Elementary School to house this stuff. And we're going to these communities. We're going to get those yearbooks and trophies. You see, Wolfhawk sent me back to Luling to get the stuff from Rosemont High School, Luling, Texas. When I got there, they didn't have nothing but a, a two draw five camera with five that thick. All the trophies, yearbooks, all this stuff was taken to the city dump and burn. We got to go get it. And we got to put our brightest and our best. And many of y'all sit right in this room to help us understand what happened to us. What did they do to our very culture and our minds? As Wolfhawk was saying. What did they do to us? And we got to undo this thing. And we can elect people to go to Austin and start passing public policies that can change the state. See, A.M. and U.T. own this thing. I don't believe God makes mistakes. Because, see, Dr. Hines asked me to, to go to Austin. He said, I want you to go and represent prayer here to the legislature. Okay. I said, how do you do this stuff? <laughs> Didn't know. So I met this lady that was with the Texas Association of Counties when I was a county commissioner, and we were in the cafeteria at the Capitol. I said, how do you do this governmental relations stuff? She said, Frank, you need to get with them boys from a and and UT. She said, they got this stuff down to a science. Every legislation that's filed, they review it and analyze it and see what's in it for them, what's good for them. So they got those spigots all over the state. I said, no, no, no. So I said, where are they? She said, they got a mansion down the street from the governor's mansion. I got my briefcase, walked down there, knocked on the door. They said, can I help you? I said, young Frank Jackson, I said, the government relations work for prayer. You know what they said? What took you so long? I've been there ever since. That's how I got promoted to system vice chancellor. I didn't ask for that. I'm hanging out with the ball. <laughs> 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 right. But it means that I can do it. Other kids can right. do it. That's right. We can do this thing. And they and they they, they on point with this. How you think we got the juvenile justice stuff? Without a stick it. Because when they talk to me, Royce, the bill that they filed died. It's still up there, dead as a donut. Me and Dr. Hines sitting up in the, in the uh, conference committee on the appropriations bill, and Garnett Coleman was on the committee. And I watched him, this senator from the Valley, Lucio, he said, I want to take $250,000 of already appropriated funds and put it toward the regional health center in the Valley. I said, Dr. Hines, how the hell are they going to create a regional health center in the Valley with $250,000? No, he said, I'm a placeholder. And they did it, boom. So we wrote on a nap and changed the Texas Institute for the Study and Prevention of Juvenile Crime and Delinquency at Prairie View. Took it right and gave it to Garnett. He said, I want to put a rock on Prairie View's budget, create the Texas Institute for the Study and Prevention of Juvenile Crime and Delinquency using appropriate funds. He said, Dr. how much money? He said, oh, $60,000. <laughs> He said, get with Luana. Luana called Symphonia. She was on the committee of uh, Juvenile Justice Committee. She hijacked Toby Goodman's bill, put 25 cents on there for prayer view. And she said, guess how much you gonna get, Frank? I said, what? She said, 1.6 million. Mm. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and now we get 50 cents. We didn't know.
know the spigots were out there. Mm -hmm. We gotta get in the game. Yes, yeah. yes, right. Find the spigots. They're out there. We can do this thing. So I'm gonna close up. No, I've shared a lot with you, but I thank y'all again for letting me be a part of this. Yes, we yes. can do this thing. So thank you. Thank you to the Victor's family. 